Welcome everybody to our virtual excursion with the paper pilots. Today we're going to be exploring um, flight science and just everything to do with paper planes. Um, so welcome, welcome to Dylan and James, our paper pilots. Hello. Okay, well, um, we should probably get started, but before we do, I just want to know one thing. You guys were the inspiration for the actual movie Paper Planes, and I'm ah. wondering, what was it like? Were you on set? Were you making planes? How did it all happen? Oh, it was amazing. Well, in 2009, James and I went to the World Paper Plane Championships, which was like the Olympics for paper planes, and then when we got back to Australia... Robert Connolly, the director for Paper Planes, rang us up and said Paper Planes would be an amazing thing to make a movie about. We agreed. <laughs> so we actually got to help him over the space of about five years, come up with all the characters and all the, all the different scenes in the movie. And then working on set was a pretty amazing experience. We didn't realise, but we actually had to fold 4,000 Paper Planes in a two-week period. And we had to train and teach all the actors how to throw paper planes. So it was a lot of work to do, but it was the best experience ever. Yeah, we had a lot of fun, certainly. We got to fold all the planes, train all the pilots, as Dylan said. So all the planes that you see in the film, we designed together with the art department, and we actually listed as the world's first paper plane consultant. How about that for a cool job title? Pretty good, huh? That is brilliant. Very good. All right, well, I'm going to leave you guys now and you're going to talk flight science. So I'll just introduce my friend and number one folding buddy, James Creasy Norton. Now, James is the 2009 world number 10 hang time champion. So James actually has designed his planes to fly straight up in the air and hang and stay in the air for a very long time. So this is his plane. This is my plane here. It's called... It's very boring looking, so it has to have a very cool name. So it's important to name your planes well. It's called the... Squarosaurus, here it is here. It's got a lot of weight in the nose, it has a very wide wing, so it flies very slowly because it creates a lot of drag over the surface of the wing. Now my wingmate here, Dylan Papercut Parker, everyone say, hi Dylan. Yeah, great. His plane is this one here. This is the Raptor. Now this plane is designed to go a long distance. I actually got third place at the 2009 World Championships with this plane. And this is designed to fly really fast through the sky like a bullet. And we'll explain a little bit about why that's important later. But let's uh, get into the science of flight. So we're going to teach you a few things about why things fly. And first we're going to start off with uh, some planes that we like to throw off buildings or catch on the updraft of buildings. They're really good for catching thermals. You saw that pool scene in the film. There was a lot of, a lot of warm air coming off that pool in the film paper planes when they're having a competition. So it was creating a bit of a thermal and kept planes like this up in the air for a long time. So like my plane, the Squarosaurus, this is the moth. It's got lots of wide wings and that's, that means that it's going to fly very slowly and it's made out of a really kind of nice 80 GSM paper. So that's a, a good plane for those sorts of activities. Now yeah, well, we'll zoom out and we'll show you this one flying very slowly through the air. Are you ready, James? Ready to catch? Nice slow flight. Now you can throw them a lot faster, but a nice slow glider helps it to stay up in the air for as long as possible. Now that's gliders. But what about really fast planes, really fast darts? Now that's like the Raptor I showed you before. If you have a look at this plane here, it's designed to go really fast. So what I'll actually do, if we zoom right out, I'm going to demonstrate this plane. You'll see how fast this plane actually goes. I'm going to go over here to do it. So watch out, James. You ready? Oh, good one, Dylan. How fast that one goes. Awesome. Now, this one here is like is called the Andrew of Keepinate. It was actually invented for the guy from Deal or No Deal. It's very fast and sleek, similar to the way he describes himself. Dylan, give that a hoik for us. See if you can hit the cameraman up the back. How about that? Right, you ready? Oh. Oh, very good. <laughs> now, darts are great, but our favourite planes at the moment... Yes. ...are the acrobatics planes. Now, if we zoom right out... We'll show you one really amazing plane that we've been folding recently. It's called Monsieur Stingray. Everyone out there say, good afternoon, Monsieur Stingray. There we go. He needs to be woken up. He's been in a box all afternoon or all morning, so he's a little bit cramped. So I'm going to throw him. He's got different surfaces on him designed to make him do flips and loops. Are you ready? What we're going to do here, we'll throw him up in the air. He does a nice big looper. James, you're Mr. Stingray. Oh, yes. Very good. Oh, tumble. That's nice. So lots of tips and tricks you can do with those 
stunt planes. And that's another category at the World Championships, acrobatics. At the World Championships, there was a guy who invented a plane that had 600 paper planes inside a single plane. So when he threw it up in the air, it exploded and 600 planes came out. Now, unusual planes. Some people don't think of planes necessarily having wings on either side. You can get planes that look a little bit like this one. This is my helicopter. Are you ready? Flying him straight in the air. He's going to oh, circle to the ground there. So just like a parasol of a dandelion, these things are like umbrellas. They kind of just float on the wind and they can travel long distances. Just like in nature with seeds, dispersing their seed along distances, that those things are really cool. Now, also roll on the air. They're microscopic, very tiny. They make your parents sneeze. This one rolls or spins through the air. It's called a xylo and it's a hollow plane. So air is travelling faster through the centre of this plane than it is on the outside. So it's getting kind of sucked through the air. So let's zoom out. Let's see how this one goes. Let's see if we can hit the camera. Whoa! <laughs> Give it a whirl. Oh, oh, it's going too fast. It's going good. Now, from the movie Paper Planes, you will have noticed uh, Deborah Mailman's character throwing a plane that looks a little bit like this. Now, we call this the, the defier because it defies all logic of paper plane throwing. But we also nicknamed this the peace plane just because of the way you throw it. You grab your peace sign, throw your peace signs up. You put your peace sign inside the plane like this with your thumb on the bottom. And when you're about to launch this plane, you kind of do a stylish basketball throw kind of thing where you stand front onto your target and you launch like that. Now, if we zoom out, James will show you how that plane actually flies. It's quite cool. Nice. Oh, look at that. What a good flight. So you don't have to stick to wings. Wings are sometimes the thing that holds you back. And it's good to experiment with different materials when you're flying your paper planes as well. I'm going to show you this plane. It's made out of 25 GSM paper, a very light paper weight. And watch how this flies, if I can follow it. All right, let's zoom out, see how we go. If I follow it with my board, I can create an updraft to keep the plane in the air almost indefinitely. Oh, uh, nearly cool, got it. Huh? Amazing, give them a round of applause. So when you go home, you practice with your brothers and sisters and your grandparents and see if you can invent some really cool designs together. Now, the reason these planes fly well is because of lots of forces on flight, but before we get to that, so zooming back out, we can look at our slides here. We're gonna take you through some of the forces on flight. Now, there's more than just um, you know, one force on flight, there's actually a lot of different forces, much more than what we're going to show you, but we're going to take you through the basic four, because when you learn about these four forces on flight, you can learn to manage your planes to get them to fly correctly, which is really important. Now, having a look at those four forces, there's four pretty important ones. If you have a look on the board here, we'll point to these ones here. Number one is gravity. You're all using it right now to sit on the ground. Stand up. Yep. We're going to do a little experiment here. Let's do a bit of a test on gravity. If everyone can hear us, can you stand up, please? We're going to do the shortest experiment ever yeah. together. All right. Now, what I want you to all do, bend your knees down and jump. Great. Great. Okay. Now, everyone sitting down on your landing gear. Have a seat. Back down again. Now, did anyone fly off into space? Hands up if you flew off into space. <laughs> oh, there's always a couple no. had their mushrooms for breakfast. <laughs> All right. Now, the reason you didn't fly off into space is because of gravity. Now, gravity is always holding things down to the ground. It means that your paper planes or your real planes are going to get pulled down to the ground as well. So we want to try and defy gravity or beat gravity, don't we? Number two, pretty important force. If you think about thrust in the same way as a real plane, we're using our arm to push our plane through the air and give our plane kind of the same as an engine would. Now, that's pushing your plane through the air, pretty cool. Number three is a pretty important force. If you've ever ridden a bike, you'll notice when you're riding into the wind, you'll feel it pushing against you. The harder you ride, the more air pushes against you, which is a bit of a problem because it'll try and slow you down. However, with our paper planes, we can use this force to help us slow down in certain situations. Like if we wanted to land or if we wanted to fly slowly, we're going to use drag. So very good force there. Number four is the rock and roll force. And James and my favorite force, of, of course. Uh, and James is going to take you through exactly how that works now. So looking up on the screen, you can see a profile of an airfoil. Now an airfoil is a very interesting shape. 
This is the shape of a cross section of a wing and you can see that air is traveling faster over the top of the wing because it has a longer distance to travel over that curved surface. So it creates a difference in air pressure, high pressure below the wing and low pressure above the wing, which lifts the plane into the air. Now with the planes that we design, we manage those four forces on flight. So you can see with the plane I'm holding up here, in the nose of the plane we've created a lot of weight and that's gonna help us manage thrust to keep the forward momentum of the plane carrying forward. But it's also making an airfoil. So that little, those lines that you can see there make an airfoil in the front of the wing that helps carry wind over the top of the wing to give the plane lift. Mm. So everything that we're doing to this plane is managing one of those forces on flight. And one of the really important things when you're folding is to make your plane symmetrical and even. That way, with drag, that third force, air is going to track over both wings in an even manner. Now, that's not going to work unless you've got your wings going in the right direction into the wind. If you throw your paper plane like this, it's not going to work, is it? If you have your plane angling into the wind at a certain angle, it's going to help your plane fly. Now, we've drawn this angle on our wings. You can see that it's actually the same angle as the crease you make when you fold your wings down. If you look up at the board here, you'll notice that there's a bit of smoke moving over this wing here, or you can have a look here. It's important to have your plane's wings flying into the wind at the right angle. It's called the angle of attack, and that's something that you can experiment with as well when you fold your plane, so pretty cool. Now, this one is one of our favorites, so if you take anything home from today, I want you to think about dihedral. Can everyone say dihedral? Great, dihedral. Now, that's really important. I'm gonna put my wings out, and Dylan's gonna use some planes to demonstrate yeah. why this is important. But for, for not only commercial planes, but also paper planes. Right. Everyone put your wings out like I'm doing. Great, now. Out in a T shape. Now if your wings are pointed out in a T shape, they're gonna help you to lift up in the air pretty well, which is good. So James is gonna fly up into the air straight up. The force is gonna push him upwards, but there's a problem. When James gets pushed over like that, say if he hits some turbulence, that force is still going in that direction off the surface of the wing. So what it's gonna do, it's going to carry him off in the direction of the door over there. But to stop that from happening, what we're going to do, we're going to angle our wings up like the start of the YMCA dance. Very good. James likes to do that on Friday nights. Now, if you hold your wings up like this in that angle, the same as those planes that we saw on the screen, what that means is the force is going to be pushing upwards but also a little bit inwards. Now, what that means is if James hits some turbulence, his wings are going to help him to stabilise. Now, if you think about your paper planes, James, here's your plane. Have a look at your planes from behind and have a look at the angle of the wings. They're slanting upwards. And if you see, there's a letter shape in the back there. It's shaped like a Y. So always think of that Y shape before you throw your plane. It's very important. Some people ask us what's the number one tip to throwing an amazing paper plane. And that's it, it's dihedral. And why that's important too for a paper plane is because when you let go of your plane, you're no longer holding that center fuselage together. It's going to open out. So if you maintain a severe Y shape, it'll allow for that Y shape to continue when your plane opens up after you let it go. And that force of lift going inwards will keep that center fuselage tucked in together nice and stable. Geez, you're good at planes, James. <laughs> now one more thing. And you'll notice that this is in nature as well. Birds have a little feather that points up on the end of their wing. And now it's not just to look cool, although it does, doesn't it? But that's to stop a certain force that starts to happen. Now I'm going to demonstrate what happens with a straight wing. If I I'm going to be my the wings out, James is going to demonstrate the wind. My wings are pointing out and it's helping me to lift up in the air because that air is rushing over my wing. But once it gets right to the end of my wing, right down near my fingertips, some sneaky air tries to escape around the end of the wing. Side on, let's try that. Side on. Tries to escape around the end of the wing and curls around and pushes down on my wing. Now that happens to big planes and just little ones like your paper planes as well. So what we're going to do to help avoid that is we're going to use something called winglets. Now if you put your wings out, everyone put your wings out. We can demonstrate this by pointing our hands up like the bird's feather. Now, if we do that on our paper planes, it's going to help our planes to stay in the air for longer and fly straighter as well. So, just like the bearded vulture that you can see up on the slide, 
These, that's a bird that travels for long distances in the air, circling on the updraft of thermals. And it's the same winglet that they use on the Globemaster, which is an amazing plane that flies long distances. So we're going to make sure we do all these things to our paper planes. We're going to engineer them so they manage those four forces on flight. Pretty cool, huh? That is so cool. I have learned so much from you two um, and I hope all you kids have learned lots as well and I hope you've got some more questions. But if you do have more questions, let Sarah know and we will we'll cross to your school so that you can ask them. We're going to hear from Surfal Primary School now. I'm glad you can now see us, Surfal. I'm sorry about that technical difficulty um, earlier. Um, okay, Surfal, uh, could you please unmute yourself and you've sent through three questions. Um, three different students, if you would like to step forward, let us know your name and then you can ask asked uh, the question to either Dylan, James or both of them. What is your favourite plane to make? Ah, that's a good question. My favourite plane to make at the moment is one that I invented the other day. I love this one. It's my favourite plane. You'll notice he's got a little horn there. He looks a little bit like a rhinoceros, doesn't he? That's why we've named him the Flynoceros. Pretty cool <laughs> plane. And he actually flies really quite straight. I'm going to throw him all the way up the back. He's still in the air. Oh, amazing throw. Now, this is my favourite plane, and Dylan will throw it from up the back a little bit later. It's called the Manta Ray. It's pretty amazing. If you look at it straight on, it's got a lovely bird wing profile, and it's based on the Manta Ray in the ocean. So just like um, birds that fly in the air, that's called aerodynamics, but creatures that lie through the ocean, it's called hydrodynamics, just like the stingray or a whale or a manta ray. Very good. Pretty Thank much. you very much. It's a great question. Thank you. Okay, Surfal, we've got another question. How did you start making paper planes? Uh, well, when I was about your age, actually, I had a family friend who was my mother's mechanic. He's a very nice guy called Ken Dwyer, and his plane I call the Ken Dwyer Flyer, and you can find it on the Paper Planes movie website as well. And it was the first plane that I could see that you could control. He taught me how to fold a plane that could circle like a boomerang and come back to me. And once I knew I could control a plane to perform a function the way I wanted it to, I found it was a lot more satisfying. And that's what's great about paper planes. When you get good at something, like paper planes, you get a lot of confidence out of it, especially if you practice. How about you, Dylan? Yeah, my mum bought me a paper plane book with some interesting drawings from Leonardo da Vinci on his flying contraptions. And I decided to fold a few paper planes and I got pretty got quite good at them, didn't I, James? Yeah, he's very good. He's my wing mate. I think you're, you're both very good at uh, folding paper planes. Um, can I just say that the um, hydrodynamics, um, I, that's a new word for me. So yeah. I have learned something, uh, quite a few new things today. That is really, really awesome. Yeah, we'll show you a plane when we get to some folding later that has what's called tubicles, little bumps or ridges in the leading edge of the fin or the wing of the paper plane and that channels air over the planes to fly them better and that's how my Squarosaurus is actually very successful with 22.8 seconds in the air at the World Championship. Yeah, wow, some, well some done. animals in nature like whales use the same thing to travel long distances which is really cool being able to use something a whale uses to swim through the water on your paper plane. So you'd be very observant through nature and you might discover there's some fantastic adaptations in flight in nature that you can adapt to your planes too. That is um, really, really great advice. Um, we've got one more question from Serpil. Um, what's your name? Can you please tell us your name and then ask the question? Ah, that's a really good question. Are you going to give him your secret, Dylan? I'm going to give him my <laughs> secret. My secret, we showed you before, there's a couple of things. The first one is making sure that your wings angle up in that dihedral Y shape. Making sure your wings angle up will help your plane to fly stable. But the other thing is practice. Now, James and I together have folded 26 thousand paper planes together. So that's a lot of practice. So we weren't always the best paper plane throwers ever. We had to work really hard at it. So making sure that you try lots of different designs and also try problem solving. So when your planes don't work or they don't fly very well, try pick them up and see if you can make them better. James has got a pretty good tip as well. So when we're folding a plane down, we're going to fold one wing down, okay? And if we just turn the page over, and use that first fold as a template, we can fold our second wing down and line it up with the first wing we created. So if we can do that, we're going to create two perfectly symmetrical wings. And symmetry is really important because it gives the plane, the paper plane balance. And it also affects drag evenly across both wings. So that's another great tip. And also, 
weight, experiment with weight in the nose. If you can make it go a little bit forward, a little bit back, you'll find it'll alter the center of gravity in your plane and you can find that sweet spot to get it flying just perfectly. Great, thank you so much for asking those questions. They were really fantastic questions. Um, and as I said, I've learned quite a lot from the um, from your responses, so that's great. Okay, I'm gonna leave you guys to it and um, you can- I'll get to the folding um, table. Fold yeah. some wow. planes. Um, after the guys are folded, we're going to hear from Woodside Primary and you've actually got five questions that you'd like to ask. So if you guys could get ready to uh, come up and um, five different students ask those questions, that would be great. Awesome. Now, what we're going to do now is we're going to shift our attention down to the folding zone, the fold zone, where James is going to fold several different planes. Now, he's not going to show you a full plane. What he's going to show you is some important folds that we find come up a lot in our favourite designs. And some of these are pretty tricky, and they look pretty cool as well as functionally help the planes to fly really well. So James is going to show you his first and favourite fold, one of the water bomb squash folds. Just yeah, just this one is absolutely fantastic. It's actually used in like heart valve replacement surgery with heart valve stints. So it's amazing how much the science of origami can actually permeate into like medical science and things like that. So here is um, a fold that I pre-set up. You can see, if I just get the angle right, you can see the shadow that I've created. I've just pre-folded this, this um, piece of paper. Now, watch me, I'll put it on the ground. I'm just gonna use my finger to pop this fold in the middle. Oh, just pop, should I do that again? Pop, it's really satisfying. And then that'll make the wings collapse down into a very small compact sheet of paper. So that's the water bomb base and it's the start of a lot of really cool paper planes. It actually is the start of two planes. I'll show you just how good that fold is. It starts off several cool little planes. Here's the first one that it starts off. Starts off the Starfighter, which is a very interesting plane with an interesting nose up the front here. It also starts off the Raptor, which is this plane here, the Dart. And it also starts off the Stingray. So if you get good at that fold, that fold's actually very versatile. Now, we're moving up a level in origami trickiness. This is called an open pop and squash fold. Now, if you can zoom in a bit closer there, you might be able to see this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to unfold this and I'm going to slide my finger inside to pop it up and then I'm going to squash it down. And I'll do the same thing to the other side just really quickly so you can see what that does. It kind of locks an airfoil in place. So looking at that Starfighter, for example, locking that in place. Ooh, there it is. Boom. All right. So the last one I want to show you I think Dylan might have the other plane up there. It's the, it's the uh, locking mechanism, and it's the same one that's used in the Eagle from the film Paper Planes. So here we go here. If I can, if you can zoom in on this bit here, you'll see that I've created a little locking mechanism. So I'm going to push that in, flip that down, and now I'm going to wrap that back behind and push the wings down. And what that does is it locks the nose together so you can't um, pull that centre fuselage apart. It locks the nose of the plane so that it locks that dihedral in place. That's really important. Okay. So how about we get to Dylan showing you some really cool planes. Oh, before we do, I'm going to show you this last one. So this is the, the fire from the movie Paper Planes. It's a circular plane. And if you, if you look in, zoom in here, maybe if I can get it at the right angle, there we go might be able to make out that inside there are little ridges and bumps, those tubicles which, are, which channel that, that air in direct uh, channels over the wing. Now, this is called a friction fit fold. It's actually one of the coolest little folds that you'll do. We're going to slide one end inside the other and it's going to friction hold together, create a circle of that piece plane. Pretty cool, huh? How about if you all can remember this, we'll show you a great plane. But before we do, Dylan's gonna show you a helicopter. Yeah, I'm just gonna show you a couple of cool planes, but this helicopter I wanted to show you because it's really, really quite simple. Now the helicopter starts off with a piece of paper like this. Now you can all try this at home, and if you uh, look up on YouTube, there'll probably be a few instruction tutorials on how to do it, but how simple this plane is pretty cool. If you put one slit in the paper, you'll see I've just done a cut down to halfway, and then two little slits either side so that I can fold them in and make the body of the helicopter 
adding some weight at the bottom by folding those up. That's actually ready to fly. Now if we zoom out, we'll be able to see this fly off the table here. Having a look at this helicopter spinning. Oh, he's crashed. There we go. Get him flying through the air. Pretty amazing little helicopter. Now, if you guys have got a sheet of paper, feel free to fold along with us, but we're going to show you now how to fold a simple design. If you haven't got a bit of a paper, just have a look at how we do our creasing and how we do our folds. It's pretty straightforward. James, you want to talk us through this one? Yeah, you're going to be able to get this later when we send you through the video, so you should be able to uh, follow well, this later if you don't have a piece of paper. On page now, Dylan's going to start this fold by folding the paper um, in half lengthways, straight down the middle of the plane. And he's going to use this crease, it's the most important crease, because it's going to set up the rest of the plane. We're going to use the centre crease as a guide. Now, to make his plane extra sharp, he can use a ruler or one of these implements. It's called a bone folder or a creasing tool. It's just a bit of a, a, a plastic um, implement that makes those creases really sharp. When you're folding hundreds and thousands of planes, this is really going to save your fingers, help you make really sharp creases. That's why they call me James Creasy Norton. <laughs> Now, folding the wings down or using that centre crease as a guide to create something that's going to resemble a house shape. This is the way a lot of paper planes actually start. You can fold many different paper planes out of these first four folds. To hold it up, there we go. You can see there's a house shape, a very sort of cheap looking basic house with a little pitched roof. Now, Dylan's going to run his finger along the roof to show you where we're going to fold the next fold. He's going to fold that line or that folded edge into the middle again using the centre crease as a guide. He's going to do the same thing on both sides to create a bit of a dart base. There we go. A steeply pitched roof, so it's turned from a regular looking house to an alpine house with a steeply pitched roof. Hold that up so they can see. There we go. Great. Now he's going to grab the, the point of the nose. He's going to fold that down. <laughs> to the intersection of those previous folds. And that's going to distribute the weight of the paper into the nose. So after we throw our planes, that weight's going to help carry the plane forward. Kind of looks like a penguin, doesn't it? <laughs> so now that we've done that one, let's fold it in half, making that pe penguin beak disappear on the inside. There we go. And now we've got to that point, which is called the angle of attack. I want you to watch where Dylan folds this plane because it's going to um, duck across here, there we go. It's going to track higher at the back and then lower at the front. Here's a template that I've pre-folded for him. It's got a line drawn on it and you can see at the nose of the plane, he's folding it in half at the front of the nose. You can see that black line intersects the nose of the plane and it, and it tapers up a little bit higher at the back to be about a quarter of the distance of the wing at the back. And that's going to set the angle of attack. Remember how we, show, we kind of talked about how the wing faces into the wind? Now that we've folded that wing down, that plane is going to face into the wind at the correct angle. Now he's going to flip it over, and he's going to use that first fold as a template to match up his plane to the other side. So now he's created two wings. Now hold your plane up, Dylan. And now he's going to show you the angle that we talked about earlier, that dihedral. Everyone say dihedral. One, two, three. Dihedral. Well done. Okay. So he's created his dihedral, but this plane is missing its winglets. Let's fold our winglets for this plane down. Making sure that we fold them so that the um, wings are parallel, the winglets are parallel with the centre fuselage. So they're tracking in the same direction as the centre fold of the plane. I can see... Is it um, S SVN Spurple Primary? I've been folding some pretty good ones there. Hold your planes up for me. Let's see. Everyone hold your planes up. Great. Now, before we fly these, how about we just do some stretches? Actually, how about we do some questions before we get into the, the flying, the test flight zone? It's a no-fly zone for now, but we'll get to that later. 
Um, I just want to say that I am so impressed with um, all of the kids f um, folding their own paper planes. Absolutely amazing. I've been sitting over the side folding my paper plane too. It doesn't look anywhere near as good as Dylan's, um, but it's great that um, everyone's having a go. So now we've got some questions from Woodside Primary School, and I know that South Grafton will also like to ask some questions. Um, so we'll have Woodside for now, and we'll have South Grafton after we um, actually do a bit of a flying. So, uh, Woodside, you've got five questions, and the first question is from Ryan. Would Ryan like to stand up? G'day, Ryan. What inspired you to make paper planes and enter competitions? Yeah, I think what inspired me was having a little bit of fun one day. I decided to go in a paper plane contest because I saw it at my university, and it turned out to be an awesome decision because I met James at that competition and we got to fold and fly paper planes. And I think what inspires us to keep doing that is that we keep coming up with awesome planes and we get to experiment and try new things. So never, never pass an opportunity up to do something fun because it might turn into a career or it might turn into something awesome like a paper planes movie. Yeah, that's a great life lesson actually. You know, you, if you get um, offered an opportunity, it's worthwhile just thinking about whether that's a good opportunity to take because you never know where it might lead. Thanks for your question, Ryan. Great. 